Hello, it's Roger Bisbee here from Skill Builder, and I'm back with the second part of our test, the TS55 Festival plunge saw, track saw, whatever you want to call it. And we ran this through, really did an unboxing on it in the first part of the test. And I said, I'm gonna take it out, I'm gonna use it, send in your questions, and we'll try and answer those questions as we run through the second part of the test. So we've got loads of questions, so thanks very much for sending those in. So let's get straight on with it, not mess around. The first question we got comes from Mr. Neanderthal. Now this was in response to people talking about this video that's on YouTube where somebody, Aves, whatever his name is, takes one of these apart and he completely trashes it, he disses it, he doesn't like it at all, and he's got a lot of views on that. And Mr. Neanderthal was saying that he's been in the trade for over 25 years, he's worked around people who've used Festival, he owns one of his saws, and he said, if what that guy was saying is true, then these things would be breaking down all the time. He said, but they're not. He said, I don't see them breaking down. He said, everyone he knows has got one, is happy with it. So all he's doing is trying to bury that story slightly because it's got a a lot of credence a lot of people believe in the engineer rather than the end user so I don't want to get involved in it honestly all I'm doing is trying to balance the thing out a bit because it did get quite a lot of response on that so let's move on to specifics Christian Snyder Christian said can you please test this saw I like your manners Christian that's really good he said can you please test this saw without the track so that we can see what it does without the track in terms of its pickup and everything. Well, I did, but the thing is that when you're using it, the off side of the, the saw is actually working without the track. It's only this side that is actually being protected by that rubber. And the, the rubber stops the, the lift. It stops the veneer or the, the laminate from picking up. So on the other side, that doesn't happen, it's just free. So you can kind of see, just by looking at a cut on the waste material, what it would have looked like if you hadn't got the track. But here's a little refinement that Festool have put in to their saw. And this, this is the splinter guard. Now, what this does is you can take it up or down. It's actually where the window goes. So if you want to swap it over so you can actually see where the front of a blade goes you need to unscrew this and take that out but if you're using the splinter guard the splinter guard sits down on whatever you're doing and you can just see there hopefully yeah you can just see that the splinter guard drops down and it stops that side of the cut from picking up. So effectively what you've done is you've doubled the effectiveness of the rail. So if you're trying to keep your waste part, if you're not cutting a bit of wood that you want to trash, then the splinter guard's necessary. For instance, if you're doing a mitre and you're trying to mitre two bits together, would it work on the mitre? No, probably not. So maybe not, maybe that's nonsense actually. Maybe on the mitre it doesn't work. But anyway, you get the idea. The splinter guard's there to help prevent that breakout. Hi darling, 76. Hi darling, hi darling. He wrote in, she wrote in, who knows, to say that he, she doesn't need this track. All they do is they use their ordinary circular saw they put a piece of plywood down, they put something to guide it with on the other side, and by cutting through that plywood, it basically does the same thing as the rail. In other words, it stops the pickup, and I guess it would even stop the pickup on the waste side of it. So yeah, you can do that, hi darling. I think that's fine. If you're of a mind to do that kind of thing, lug bits of plywood around with you, fine. A lot of people just like the convenience of having the track, you know, treat yourself, life's short. You know, some people just like to own the kit. You can't argue with that. Hindu SPL, he, Hindu SPL, sorry if I mispronounce it, I don't know. You know, it's very hard sometimes on YouTube to get a hang of what people's names are actually, but Hindu SP1 maybe, that's what it is, Hindu SP1. He said, what's the most important difference between this track saw, the REQ and the REBQ, which he's seen around? Well, all it is is that the REBQ has got that break. 
it actually has an electronic brake. For one, some reason or another, this 110 version doesn't have an electronic brake. I don't know why that is, but it's obviously something to do with the electronics. They can't do it in 110, but that's what you've got. You've got the REQ, you've got the REBQ, the electronic control, that's what the E stands for, the electronic control on the motor. So you've still got that on both versions, but that added brake, they keep adding little bits. And every time they add a little bit, they add a letter. You know, they even added a, a letter to tell you that you've got a, a plug it lead here, you know. In actual fact, if you want me, I read this little bit out that I got from Festool because I didn't find it very easy to find the information on their site. So I went straight to the source. I went to Festool. I spoke to Phil Beckley, who is their training officer, the technical trainer. And he said the REBQ R is the revised updated model. Four years ago, it had some design changes. E, which is electronic control. That's the speed control, regardless of load. B is the brake on the motor. And Q is the plug it lead. So there you are. So when the R version was launched, the following benefits were added. And it had this flat sided housing added, which means that you can go up to 12 millimeters within 12 millimeters of a wall or something like that. So if you're trying to cut out flooring or you're trying to cut into a worktop, maybe when you're plunge cutting a sink in and it's right up against the back there, then that allows you to do that. So the splinter guard, that was a new thing that they added and they reckon that it cuts two millimeters closer to the nearest competitor, which is DeWalt. So DeWalt, they reckon, has got 14 millimeter cut to the wall. Same idea, flat housing. So there you are, that's basically it. Quillers 3 asked, is it brushless? He said, it might be a stupid question, but is it brushless? Quillers, the rule is, on Skill Builder at least, there are no stupid questions. Any question you've got, even if everyone else knows the answer to it. I've sat in training sessions and somebody said something and I thought, I hope somebody asks a question in a minute because I haven't got a clue what this guy's talking about. And in the end, nobody does ask the question. Stick my hand up, ask the question, and then everyone else goes, oh yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So you ask, mate, if it's you and nobody else that wants to know the answer, that's absolutely fine. It's not brushless. The mains powered versions aren't brushless. The cordless ones are. Now we'll be testing the cordless one, the cordless version of this saw soon. It's an interesting bit of kit. It's got two 18 volt batteries. So if you put the two 18 volts on together, you get 36 volts, which is as much in the terms of RPM as this baby is kicking out. So it comes close to being a mains powered machine other than the runtime. Obviously, you've got to keep recharging the batteries, but it allows you that portability, that versatility, and you can use it on a single 18 volt battery. You get a reduction in the RPM on that, but, uh, and also when it starts up, there's quite a draw on the current. So having those two batteries in there is a good idea, but if not, you can run it on the 18 volt while you're charging the other 18 volt up. But if you want maximum performance, you put both 18 volt batteries on at the same time and away you go. But as I say, we're gonna test that later, but that is a brushless motor on that cordless version. Rory LeBan says, or reminds us that Makita do an adapter rail so that you can use their ordinary circular saw as a track saw. So it's not a plunge saw in that situation, but it does allow you to do, use it as a track saw. Interestingly, now Festool also do a non-plunge version of this saw, which hinges just at the front as a conventional one does. So they're both kind of moving into each other's territory, if you like, you know, they see an advantage here and, they, and they're into it. Interestingly, Again, that Milwaukee one, we don't know what they're gonna bring out, but they've got a track saw on the way, so I'd be interested to see whether that is a plunge or a non-plunge or who knows, or maybe they allow you to use the two saws on the same track and, and they've done that, I don't know. We'll see, hopefully we'll see when they get it out. Right, next we've got a question from Matt Smith, and Matt's a kind of regular viewer. He sent some good comments in on the ends of the video, so it's interesting to see. Uh, Matt, you've got a great, easy to pronounce name as well, which is good. So Matt, Matt says, when he first used his dad's DeWalt saw, 
He said he forgot to engage the anti-kickback. He said, and the thing jumped back out on him, on him and went for his foot. It didn't harm him, but it was a close thing and it scared him quite a lot. I know that feeling. I've had exactly the same thing. And most people I know who've got a track saw at some time or another have had that experience where it jumps back. In fact, I've lent my track saw to people and it's come back with little nicks out of the rail where people go, oh, just jump back on me. I didn't know what was going on. The reason it jumps back mainly, mainly and not always, is because the back of the cut pinches on the blade and it rides out. So the important thing is to support your workpiece all the way along. But this has got a riving knife which drops down, which is a really good thing. It's got two functions that riving knife. It helps to keep the back of the cut open, but it also means that you can line up the saw if you're continuing the cut. So if you're moving the rail along, you can drop that riving knife down into the cut and line it up and then make sure that you're continuing the cut on exactly the same line. So very useful thing, but that anti-kickback is a problem. And Matt says, does this saw have an anti-kickback device? Not as such. I mean, it has got one. It's got, it's, you buy it as an extra for about 10 quid from Festool and it drops in the track behind the saw and does a job. But even then, I've seen people with anti-kickback on like the Triton, for example, has got anti-kickback and the saw can still jump up alarmingly and lift the track up with it. And of course, if it's not locked into the track, then that is a problem because it will then come down and nick the track. Have a look at this video. This is Duncan, my assistant. He was trying to keep out the way of the camera. So he was using it sort of in an awkward position. He was using it one handed. And if you look, you'll see that the back of the saw, the riving knife there, isn't quite on the track. He hasn't got the whole saw on the track when he starts. Should have pulled that track back a bit more, but it's worse than that because we were cutting a bit of window board and the window board was on top of a bit of laminate. So that was slippery and smooth. So the whole thing just shot forward. The saw came up in the air. Duncan was very alarmed at that point, so was I and you could see the blade was still turning when he brought it down and it was kind of just like that and um, could have been nasty, you know? So you've got to take great care. The important thing is if you can use it two-handed, do use it two-handed, support that workpiece and always remember that the thing might jump out at you. Personally, I'm not a big fan of those anti-kickback devices because I like to slide the saw up and down in the rail and a lot of those stop you doing that. So I like to have that freedom of movement and I accept the fact that I've got to be careful when I'm using it, keep two hands on it and watch out. It's not hugely powerful. It's a 1200 watt machine this, so you should be able to handle it. That somebody was talking about using their big snorters, they call it, their massive great Makita saw on a rail with an adapter. Now that's great, you can do that, get really big nine inch saw if you like. Uh, the only trouble is that is quite a powerful motor to be using. So again, you need plenty of control over that. And if you use it, if you're somebody who uses a saw like that, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Those things are vicious if they're not controlled properly. So I wouldn't give it to somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Another point I'd just like to make about this saw, having used it, I said in the initial part of this review that I thought the tracks were all coming out of the same factory because they were very, very similar. In actual fact, on closer examination, I found that there's a difference. The Makita one has a lip under it and that lip is there to lock the saw into the track. And the reason you want to lock the saw into the track is when you do your 45 cut and you've got it over like that, there is a tendency for it to want to tip. It's just on the balance there, you can see. And it's all right when you're using it, you kind of put one hand down away from the blade, I might add, but what put one hand down to steady it and away you go and it's fine. But of course, as soon as you finish your cut and you take your hands off a saw and you, you turn around, the thing could crash to the floor. So that idea that Makita have got of locking the saw under the track is a great idea, and I'm sure that Festival will love that idea, but of course you can't do it with their track. It just doesn't allow it because it hasn't got that lip. So there's a difference between those two saws and a good reason for me 
uh, why I like that Makita saw. This is a great saw, they're both great saws, but they've all got these little features that, uh, that they have. The other thing Makita got, they've got a little scribe cut setting, so you can just go through and your first cut is a couple of mil. I find that quite useful because if, for example, here we've got a splinter guard for, for stopping that breakout, but the other way of stopping that breakout is to do a minimal cut all the way through, say two millimeters, and that'll just cut into the, the face of whatever it is, if you're using a wood veneer, just cut, or plywood, it'll just cut into the face of that and stop that bit of break out there. So I find that very effective. But they've all got something, they all bring something to the party, and that's the beauty of competition. Mark Garth, Mark asks, what's it like if you don't put that dust extractor on? What's the dust like? Well, I tried it with the dust extractor, and without the dust extractor, you can see that depending on what you're cutting as well, some timber, some MDF and things like that tend to be a bit more dusty. I do know that in those situations, a dust mask and a dust extractor is a good idea, but on a good day, it's gonna take 95% of the dust away. On a bad day, it's gonna take a little less, but the dust extractor is obviously worth having, and that Festool dust extractor is a nice bit of kit, expensive. You can get other ones. I tend to use another one, which is a bit cheaper, still does the job. So, yeah, I mean, there's dust. It's got to go somewhere. So if you look at these pictures, you can see where it's going. So Joe Downey contacted us and he said, I love these reviews. He said, your reviews, skill builder reviews. He said, I always learn something. Well, we all do. Quite honestly, every day is a school day, Joe. Every time I try a, a tool out and I have to do a bit of research into it, read the instruction booklet properly, which is something a lot of us don't bother doing, but you have to have a good look at it. You have to ask a few questions and I always learn something. No matter what tool it is, there's always something to be learned. So it's me as well as you that's learning. And of course, when people send their comments in, you learn a bit more as well. So keep those comments coming in. I really love to see the comments from end users who have owned the tools for a while, giving us their experience of the tool, telling us whether they love it or hate it. So that to me is the real value of these reviews. So please keep those comments coming in. Peter Brett, he contacted us. Hello, Peter. I know Peter very well. He works for a tool business in the Hire magazine and he reviews tools. And he said he's just done a review on the Calder's tool. Fantastic bit of kit, he said. So don't forget to have a look at that. So there you are. There's an option for people. If you want to unplug yourself from the plug it lead, then you can do that. So that's it. I hope I've dealt with all those questions as thoroughly as I can. Thank you very much for sending them in again. And don't forget to come back soon because we've got lots more. We've got to have more festival. What are we going to do? We're going to do the plunge saw, cordless. We're going to do the saber saw, which is their kind of chainsaw on a rail, if you like. And we're going to do that domino. And probably we're going to do a jigsaw, cordless jigsaw as well. So lots more coming up on the festival front and all other tools as well. We're going to be looking at other stuff. So we'll have plenty for you to see. If you're not a subscriber, please become a subscriber. That helps us a lot helps us go from strength to strength. We really need to see subscribers growing to allow us to do what we do. So thanks very much for watching. I'm Roger Bisbee and I'll see you again soon. In fact, I won't see you, but you'll see me. You know what I mean anyway. <laughs>